What I wanted to do was to just give you sort of what I did a little study on, um, and uh, probably others have done this as well, and using sort of the work of uh, uh, Breeden and uh, Litzenberger, and at the same time, Figlewski, uh, to try to figure out what the markets were saying, the risk markets were saying, uh, as to what the risks were in the economy, at least as reflected by the S&P 500 uh, stock index, but also would be true, I think, generally with any index, whether it was uh, U.S. only or international. I just have a richer set of data available for the S&P 500 uh, back, actually, to uh, 1996 on a daily basis. But um, here is the uh, a graph or plot of the... Uh, state prices, as was talked about, but it would be the um, extreme uh, insurance cost to insure the tails of the distribution of the S&P, at least that 10 percent of the worst case possibilities in the S&P 500, and that was um, as reflected in market prices. And basically using uh, the uh, strip of put options, the insurance contracts that were priced in the marketplace, um, and uh, to use them as an indication of the, uh, of the uh, 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 probabilities or downside, not on a, uh, uh, on a <coughs> actually implied uh, probabilities or therefore the prices of the downside. So basically, uh, obviously, put options that are out of the money, put options protect you for uh, the downside, but it, at extreme movements. So for example, if the index were 100 and the uh, exercise price of the option were below 80, then you're not protected for the first 20 uh, down, but you're protected afterwards. So these prices uh, are available each day in the market. and. They are the market's estimate of the cost of ensuring the tails of the distribution, and I'll explain why I concentrate more on the tails. The reason I concentrate more on the tails, because when tail events occur, then risky assets all behave as one. So you get very large correlation spikes in the distribution in the payoffs. And so when you have the middle of the distribution, basically the middle of the distribution has a lot of uh, correlation, a lack of correlation, and everyone can use the middle of the distribution for diversification. But when the growth assets, when all the assets in the economy, um, we have shocks to the economy or tail uh, losses and gains, then it's the case that the, um, that, uh, basically the correlations all become very high. So in a shock, at times a shock, whether it's a bad shock or a good shock, then uh, diversification is lost. So what we have is the idea that diversification is free. Yes, it is, but it's not free really when you need it because you don't have diversification at times of shock. And so looking at the tails of the distribution actually give you more information than what really happens in the middle of the distribution in my point of view and uh, what's going on. So what in looking at the tails is very important for what we're talking about financial crises or crises and how they evolve over time. And when I, you look at this, you see that there's sort of three distinct periods here, four distinct periods in these data that we looked at from uh, 2005 until um, 2009 or towards the end of 2009. And the first period is what I call sort of the great moderation period where downside probabilities of loss or the price of insurance for the tails was very low, 10%. 10, 10, uh, 10 so that means that, by the way, I just want to explain here that these are using two-month put options. So just the sequence of two-month put options rolling and so the 60-day options. And then additionally, these are what the downside would be over the next 60 days of time. You know, so rolling them forward each period of time. And the reason that I use the short term is because at time of shock, there's no long term. At time of shock, everything is short term. 
uh, using Bob's analogy of uh, medical problems, you know, if you have a, a friend has a heart attack and calls you up and says, uh, uh, you know, what can I do? And I say, don't do anything right now. I'm going to call six ambulance companies and 21 doctors and then where the best hospitals are, and then I'll tell you what I'll do for you. No, you don't have that time because basically every period matters and really the most interesting in finance is not the middle of the distribution, even though we all concentrate on the middle of the distribution in our lives, it's the tails. Tails are everything and the middle really doesn't have uh, that much effect on uh, how we accumulate wealth or how we make decisions and the toughest time is actually at time of shocks. And so the first period here was the 60-day option insurance premiums were about uh, for the tails. This is the 10 percent of the worst cases that could possibly arise in expectation and I use the expected tail loss as these 10 percent of the worst cases was around 0.1. So 10 percent down would be a, uh, a, a tail loss that could occur about 10 percent on the time in expectation. And that was pretty steady over this period of time and then did increase at around the time of the, uh, you know, Bear Stearns uh, defaults of their mortgage contracts and then uh, the fact that Bear Stearns was uh, taken over and or bought by uh, J.P. Morgan and, uh, and uh, continued. But then the, the, the actual downside risks were not, didn't revert back to the great moderation period. They stayed about uh, 20 20 percent so 20 percent loss as opposed to 10 percent loss and that went along fine they fluctuated around the market was saying loss prices were increasing and decreasing and um, they went up uh, to some extent uh, as the crisis unfolded but then what happened was we had um, at the time of the Lehman collapse you know it wasn't as if the market was saying at that moment there was something that we had to, uh, the prices of protection didn't jump up dramatically until such time as the uh, decision about what and how much of a interjection the government was going to use, not only domestically but internationally. And then uh, as the various things, now you see that the, uh, the protection prices went up dramatically to about 50 50 percent so that a 50 percent downside probability and 10 percent of the worst cases so here you're buying assets or risky assets and you're talking about a huge down possibility continuing not even as the government was deciding on things so you have a convolution you know if the government didn't intervene, what would it be? And if the government does intervene and gets involved in trying to decide things, and I, as people said, obviously Mr. Geithner and uh, Sir Bernanke and uh, before that Mr. Paulson and that were trying to figure out exactly what to do because the patient was maybe having a heart attack or they thought the patient was having a heart attack and how are you going to address it? But the interesting thing here is as soon as, or soon as the market came to the, conclusion that basically you were having a uh, resolution and then a guarantee later on of essentially the assets in the system, okay, then basically uh, the uh, prices of protection fell quite dramatically back down, not to the uh, great moderation period, but to the, um, you know, the pre, uh, pre-Lehman and uh, after uh, the 20 percent. Uh, so um, what you have here, in my view, and I can show you just a, uh, a different uh, picture of uh, somewhat the same thing, but in just expanding it a little bit, where I put here on the upper graph now, the red is the, um, we have on one side of the market gives us the price of protection, like the protection of the tails of the distribution, and the other part of the distribution is the uh, upside potential or the 10% of the best cases. So the expected tail gain is the deuce from out of the money call options give you a price of that and by using the strip of put options and call options it's possible to get the entire forward distribution uh, uh, centered at the risk-free rate of what the market is saying 
is the risks going forward. But the interesting thing in the short run, in my view, at times of crisis, trying to look at the tails, you know, the mean is great, as Bob said, it takes maybe three or 400 years to get the exact mean, but it's really the uncertainty. Risk dominates. In a lot of ways, in the short run, everything is risk and everything is not the mean. You know, it's risk that has the largest effect on everything we tend to do. So basically, what I have here on the upper line is, and that would be on the right uh, axis, is the, um, which says what the price, the expected tail gain to expect the tail loss was. And notice here that it, as you went along, that basically the market, as it as the price is indicated, the mark, what we learned here by looking back at this is the market said, look, the distribution of risk is about the same. In other words, it's pretty symmetric. You know, Even though the tail losses increase, the tail gains increase. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. It wasn't as if everyone knew something was going to go down or everything, because it would have been there already. And basically, there was a lot of uncertainty about the upside, a lot of uncertainty about the downside, and the tails got bigger on both sides. So you know, the crowd, some was saying yes, and some was saying no in terms of what was potentially happening. So it wasn't obvious as you went along. But notice here, at the time when you had the convolution, the markets were, defaults were coming, the government was involved in trying to decide the best policy. Then you had huge negative skewness. What it was saying at that time was the downside risk was very large relative to the upside tails at that time. And then it went quickly after the, after the um, spike in the downside risk subsided and you went down in prices then to the, again, to the, um, to the uh, 0.2 level or 20% level, then again, the upside to downside was somewhat symmetric. But it was the case, actually, when it's like things were coming down and the government policies were being invoked and put into place, you had a situation where the upside potential became much greater than the downside. So the market was saying there was great positive skewness in the possible returns that were in the market at that time. So what is interesting here is the period of, of, of real uncertainty where the insurance costs were very high was a quite a short period of time. You know, it was after Lehman to after the government then uh, insured essentially the um, the downside of many of the financial institutions. And basically, during that period of time, that's so unlike the period in the 30s, okay? In the 30s, as I read, nothing was resolved for years, okay? So here you had, in the financial crisis, time had stopped. What happened was someone had a heart attack, okay? Time stops. And what I mean by that is that there's decision time and there's calendar time. Everything in finance or economics is not calendar time. It's really volatility time or risk time. Because if you have an ability to do, you have the team in place. My view is that you can have sufficient human capital or other skills in place to handle every possible contingency just the same way as if your friend has a heart attack, you're not going to try to get the best information, the best process. You have to decide quickly on how to act or you don't act at all. So when a crisis occurs, when you end up in a situation where you have um, uh, huge shocks occur, potentially large losses could occur, then it means that it's an intermediation or the whole process of intermediation tends to stop or tends to come to a halt until such time again as those who do provide intermediation services have a new fix point or a new way in which they can intermediate. Because intermediation is really uh, velocity. It's turnover. It's buying things and, and selling them. And it's not. And so if you are turning over something, then you can't uh, do mathematics and look at derivatives or change without having a fixed point. 
And I really call this the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle of finance. You know, if you can't, at the same, if you get a trembling hand where you can't continue to intermediate because the information asymmetries are very large and you're not the information asymmetry so much as your ability to know the fixed points, then basically what happens, you need time. And so the question becomes in our society and what I try to think about and necessarily have all the conclusions to is the idea that what we want to do is say what role does the government provide in terms of time? Time, because we, and we can't have all the resources in our entities to be able to handle every possible contingency. And, you know, at the time, because the cost of the human capital is very high. I believe that human capital would be sitting around, so then how do we create for society a way to garner that capital to supply time for reintermediation to again occur in, in the economy. Sure, I, I think that there were, um, and I just have one more just to show you. I mean, there's other ways in which the market is, you know, I, I didn't put this in, but just looking at the CDS, for those who have good eyes, this is the CDS spreads that were available on various of the financial institutions. And at the time of Bear Stearns failure, you know, the, the CDS spreads went out, here they went out. But I, I'm, what I'm trying to uh, articulate here, say, is that basically what we want to think about is the markets have information. Prices have information. Those prices are very valuable. And using prices it, are very valuable to really understand what it is that people are, are uh, worried about and doing in terms of how they're pricing uh, these particular risks. So, Look, in the great moderation period, it was the case that um, you know, we had an increase in the amount of, uh, I think in particular, I think I remember a, a lunch I had with uh, Peter, uh, and he described to me that the banks uh, had a business, was turning over inventory, initiating particular securities and, and uh, mortgages, et cetera. And that was their job, was to, to do uh, servicing and to do turnover, turnover. It's velocity, turnover. But they had to carry inventory on their books at the same time. And that inventory was expensive to carry. Even though it made a competitive rate of return, there were other regulatory costs and tax costs associated with holding the inventory on their books. And so that uh, idea, which came, I'm not going to credit it to him, but I mean, came from the uh, J.P. Morgan and others, was to say, how do we get this inventory off our books and concentrate on their business itself, which is turning over inventory, intermediation. It's buying at wholesale and selling at retail. You know, and essentially, that's what the intermediation business is, worrying about the risks that we're having and running the business accordingly. So that's built then the idea of securitization or securitizing. And so it was a young business, okay? I'm not saying necessarily it was mature, but I do believe the securitization business needed someone to be a vouchsafing in part for the structures that were put in to the various tranches in the uh, structures that you've had for CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, or, or credit cards uh, uh, structures, or, or for mortgage structures, which is the uh, CMOs, you know, and the like. And so you had various tranches, and the rating agencies were used to vouchsafe, you know, those particular uh, tranches, give them AAA ratings, or et cetera. And the residuals were then taken by the entities themselves, the various banks and other institutions. The real question is, and going back in terms of looking at the crisis and the evaluations, was were, <laughs> you know, the, um, were enough uh, skin in the game was held by the particular institutions? And without a sufficient skin in the game, was it the case that they abrogated or they gave up the idea of, of saying, if I have to take this risk, I, then what's the cost to me? 
of no skin in the game, I'm not going to do as much monitoring, as much care of the business. And so velocity and the quality of what was done was then reduced. So relying on the rating agencies to give the tranches the actual ratings themselves meant that you had three fallacies that are prevalent in finance. And the rating agencies uh, did not overcome these. And the three fallacies uh, that are crucial is, and you can really amplify it and understand it and what they are in finance, is fallacy one is do not data mine. <laughs> if you look at the past and see there's no defaults on housing, that does not mean there's not potentially going to be defaults, OK? Especially if you looked at other countries and other circumstances in which there were defaults. So if you look, if you look at the past data, then basically that's fine. But are you drawing? It's the same thing as AI and big data. Are you drawing from the correct distribution? Is that giving you the uh, bootstrap that is essentially correct in understanding the risks ahead? And you know, using um, and that's number number one. And uh, number two is that um, I think that uh, assuming uh, that the correlation structure is constant. You have VAR, all this technology was built on the idea that we have drawing from the same distribution. Or if we keep drawing from the same distribution, then OK, the correlations are constant or knowable. And the distribution is known. We can use VAR or diversification. And that works. But as we know, at time of shock, that's not true. And all the correlations, all the cross-section correlations change dramatically. And so it was a surprise to the models that people in Stockton, California, defaulted on their mortgages as people in Nevada did and Las Vegas as the people in Florida did. You know? So all the models were based on this diversification or cross-sectional independence were lost. In times of shock, Correlations are not your friend. You don't have it. Virtually everything in the risky assets goes close to one. We have to plan for that. And the third problem was, which may be the most pernicious, there's cheaters out there, OK? In other words, there are cheaters in our society. It's not, they're not, we're not a friendly group. You know, if you give me a model, and the rating agencies were very friendly. They told you what the model of rating was. So people say, oh, I put in too many good triple A's in here. You know, I better lard it up with a little bit of this bad stuff. So I just passed the test. You know, how many of you have taken tests or, and study and study and study? No, you try to figure out how much you can study to get the A, you know, not, not to get the pseudo A, you know, which would be perfect. So basically, it's this idea of gaming against the system. Every model, as Bob referred to earlier, every model has an error. And people reverse engineer the error of the model. That's obvious you know, when you think about it. But it's so prevalent if you looked at what the rating agencies did in terms of the reverse engineering. So the question is, when we have this view, then how do we think about, and this is, you know, I don't exactly know the answer, but the idea is that when time stops, when people make mistakes or have bad models, then the question is, and we have these downside risks increasing, then when basically you could have gigantic losses and a lot of resources done, then a lot of what we have seen over the last number of years in the regulatory side is trying to think about a liquidation process or an orderly process. But is it really going to stand up? That's what we have to ask. Should the government and the regulators and we study what to do with it when there's a sh when there's a heart attack. You know what to do when there's a shock. May should that be more of our focus and say let's be realistic. You know don't believe that we just have a resolution and we can get these firms can just disappear. You know and they go into without realizing that the whole financial system stands behind that. And so even though we have the cost as Debbie brought up, we also have the idea of saying you know what would the cost be if we did nothing or we had these people done. So those are still a lot of open thinking that has to be done. But I really believe we should use market prices and believe in them in the way we tend to do things uh, going forward. And there's a tremendous amount of information in what the market is telling us about the risk. So thank you. Thank you very much.